Welcome to this uh, Fence Friday webinar. The title of this webinar is Brain Development and the Neuropsychiatric Disorders. So within the next uh, hour, you will hear four uh, talks from four different speakers. Uh, but before we start, I would like to make a couple of announcements. Um, so you will see the Q&A button in uh, your Zoom screen. So questions uh, will be answered at the end of the four talks during the Q&A session. Uh, if you have a question during the talks, you can simply write them in the Q&A section at the bottom, as I said, in the Zoom window. And it's best if you specify if your questions are addressed to a specific uh, speaker or to a whole panel. So it's best if you write, for example, the name of the speaker or write everyone. Uh, the chat is, is disabled, so you can only use your uh, Q&A section to address your questions. Um, if, there, if there are some questions that cannot be answered due to time limitations, they will be listed along with the associated responses on the webinar page um, about one week after the webinar. And also anonymous questions are not allowed. Uh, so I will stop sharing my screen to allow Simon to share his. Um, so we will start with the first talk from uh, Simon Watt, who is an associate professor at the University of Oxford. So I actually have a problem in that I can't find my PowerPoint. Um, so hold on a sec. So just to gain some time, um, the title of Simon's talk will be building neocortical networks, GABAergic interneurons uh, as mediators of early sensory activity. Okay, thank you, Kiki. And um, thank you everybody at FENS for putting on this webinar and, and also to my fellow panelists. Um, I'm really excited about this. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Okay, so um, because I'm kick, kicking off the session, um, I just wanted to give a little background about what I think we should be, you know, sort of considering and hopefully discussing. And the first thing I really want to get across is that, you know, represented by these two images here, which is a brain at gestational week 15, a human brain at gestational week 15, and one at week 41, is that development is an incredible feat of biological engineering, okay? We got to realize that, you know, there's a lot of processes going on. And in this particular webinar, um, we're going to try and tackle some of those. Um, we're going to move around various cortical areas. I put somatosensory and prefrontal cortex up on this particular schematic. And we're also going to talk about neuromodulators, how they might influence development and sort of bring the brain online. Now, my particular interest and what I'm going to try and convince you of in the next sort of nine, 10 minutes is that GABAergic interneurons are, you know, really fundamental to this, this process. And putting up this image on the right hand side here, this is uh, actually a coronal section uh, through the human forebrain. And what you can see labeled there are two transcription factors, NKX21 and SP8. And what they're labeling are the progenitors that are going to give rise to cortical interneurons. So if we just move out to, to the side, why do I think these are really important? Well, I think one of the incredible things in terms of that, you know, engineering the brain and getting it online is that we've known for quite a while now, and that human data shows that it's happening or happened in our brains, that cortical interneurons originate from a completely different source to the pyramidal projection neurons, the excitatory cells that make up the majority uh, of the neurons in our brain. And that fluorescent image I've got on the right hand side is from uh, my lab. And it's actually uh, fate mapping of NKX21 interneurons that are labeled by uh, various markers such as parvalbumin and somatostatin. And what I'm going to talk about uh, through this talk is a particular subtype of those and make the argument that I think these are fundamental to sort of sensory awakening of the neocortex. But let's just step back a bit and think about why we actually need 
diverse gabbro chicken Why are gabbro chicken important? And why is my lab particularly interested about how those interneurons are sort of coming online in the developing brain? And the sort of italics in the title is really the way we're thinking about it at the moment. We believe that the gabbro chicken are important for information transfer. Now we know this in the adult brain, um, you know, as neuroscientists, we, we like to think you know, in a variety of ways about what the brain does. But let's be frank. What it does is it takes sensory input, internally generated signals, combines those together to give an effective motor output, our behavior. How does it do that? Well, I'm not going to be able to do that on the level of the whole brain. And so what we've been doing is going down to the circuit level to the sort of meso circuit level, looking at how cortical columns, like individual processing units, integrate that information all the way through development. And I've got here in this schematic, just a representation of what we would regard as a canonical cortical circuit. Now, one of the things, and it's in the title there, is that these Gabriel continuums are diverse. And we've got to appreciate how that diversity might enable that information transfer. But ultimately, sort of at the cellular level, what all of these cells are going to be doing is leading to the synchronization of pyramidal cells. So we get effective summation of that information and it will go through the circuit to ultimately lead to motor output. Now, this is the sort of image and, you know, the papers cited, they're all done in uh, adult preparations. This is sort of feeling we get in terms of the adult brain. Is this true through development? And a number of years ago, uh, we published a paper. Uh, this was the work of Andre Marquez Smith, where we actually described a gabriogic circuit that is not static during development. We have a transient network. And on the right hand side here, I'm showing you a couple of morphologies we recovered. We never actually published these because you can see that the cells exploded as we exited uh, with the pipette. But hopefully what you can see is you've got massive arborization of the axons in the barrels of this is a postnatal day four somatosensory cortex. But you can also see collaterals going up to the marginal zone. And if you can just track back down, you can see one going down towards the subplate. And actually the cell on the right here we've reconstructed. What we have here is a single interneuron innovating multiple levels in the developing circuit. Now what Andre did was he then recorded layer four spiny stellate cells through development. And what I'm going to sort of focus all my, uh, uh, you know, all the data I'm showing you is various particular periods during that development. The first is neonates, which we would say is up until postnatal day four or five. Then from postnatal day five through to postnatal day sort of eight or nine, we have what we call the critical period of plasticity in layer four. Both of these are what we would call the passive sensory phase. And then sort of postnatal day 12 to 14 onwards, we're gonna enter what we call the active uh, sensory phase. Now, Andre mapped the total GABAergic input onto the layer four spiny stellates. And that's the data I'm showing you down here. This is actually using laser scanning photostimulation of caged glutamate. And what you can see is as we go through the neonate and into the critical period, we have this source of inhibition from layer 5B, perhaps top of layer six. During the critical period, you start to see a few more holes appearing. I should say each of these columns is an individual cell. But then as we kick into the active sensory phase, that transient network has gone. We've entered the mature state, okay? So this circuit that we see in the, two, uh, the first two time periods is drawn here in this particular schematic. And we refer to this as the layer 5B layer 4 loop. Um, and you're welcome to go look at the paper because actually we show this is reciprocal connection um, between those, those two cells. What you can also see is another interneuron located within layer 4 that is uh, 
labeled by parvalbumin. It's going to be a fast spiking interneuron. And we know from the work of many, including John Isaac, that these cells will be, be providing uh, fast feed forward inhibition uh, in the more uh, mature circuit in the adult. So one of the thoughts we had was actually we've now got competition between these PV cells and this transient layer 5B, layer 4 loop, that they may be going to outcompete those layer 5B cells, which are actually expressing a neuropeptide called somatostatin. What's interesting about this is the work of many labs, um, but in particular Beatrice Rico, who's now at uh, King's College London, have shown that there are certain molecules that govern the formation of these synapses, regulate these synapses, including neuregulin 1 and ERB4, which are, you know, for want of a better word, historical candidates for a variety of neurodevelopmental psychiatric disorders. So we hypothesized if we could prematurely drive the integration of the PV cells, we might outcompete those somatostatin cells in this transient circuit. So Here's wild type data. You can see, see this layer 5B connection onto 4. And as we kick through development, getting to the sort of you know, juvenile stages here, we can see it collapsing into the particular layer. However, if we record from uranium 1 overexpressing animals, driving the, the premature integration of those PV cells, we never see that 5B connection. So we can outcompete them. What are the consequences in terms of you know, sensory uh, innovation? Well, uh, a series of experiments blind to the genotype, Andre uh, stimulate, electrically stimulated the thalamus and recorded from layer four. And this is the result you see. Basically, through the passive phase of sensory exploration, we see no thalamic input into layer four in the neuregulin one mutants. There is a bit of a recovery as we get later, um, and actually we haven't looked beyond that, but what we would imagine is that it will gradually uh, recover. So this suggests, um, and what we put forward in this particular paper is that somatostatin cells in somatosensory cortex are really key for sensory integration. So the obvious thing is, and you know, a lot of those experiments were done in vitro, is that we switch in vivo. And this is uh, data, you know, unpublished data that we're sort of putting together right at this, uh, at this moment. And so we've used optotagging, um, a technique where we express channel rhodopsin in particular somatostat, uh, in particular interneurons. We then record their activity, both spontaneous and sensory evoked, and then optically tag are, are interneuron of interest. In this particular case, somatostatin cells. And what I can say is both through the passive sensory and the active sensory windows, um, we see recruitment of somatostatin cells. And I've just got two example neurons here. Um, these are raster plots. So each of these dots is action potentials uh, in a single unit um, across a number of trials. And what you can see is obviously in the passive sensory somatostatin cell, we've got, you know, the spiking is a bit delayed, there's some spontaneous stuff going on, there's a lot more activity as we kick through uh, to the active sensory window. Now, putting all of that data together, we see the following. So first thing is, um, we can opt to tag a whole bunch of somatostatin cells. A lot of these in the early phase, in the two sort of passive windows. So if you remember there, the neonates up until about P5, and then through the critical period of plasticity, you know, about 50% of those somatostatin cells do not respond to uh, sensory input. Suddenly, as we kick through to active, we see that all the somatostatin cells are engaged. What about the layer location of those cells? And the key thing to note is that at you know, the early time points, they're primarily located in infragranular layers. So it looks like our somatostatin cells are recruited. Um, are they important? Well, in a series of experiments, um, Leah Baruchin in the lab, and this is actually on bar archives, so I'm gonna go through this quite quickly. Um, he did various uh, sensory stimulations, including doing uh, paired stimulation. 
And in the control animals, we actually see facilitation during this critical period of plasticity for layer four. We then silenced all the somatostatin cells using a particular genetic model where we uh, delete SNAP25 and we don't get action potential dependent vesicular re release of uh, GABA. And when we do that, we basically remove that facilitation. We no longer see you know, this, this paired pulse facilitation onto layer four spiny stellate neurons. So this again confirms that somatostatin cells are really important uh, for early plasticity in somatosensory cortex. The twist in the tail is this, um, and this is my last results slide. We've also started doing this across other cortical areas. And I'm gonna show you the data from V1, um, but we have moved elsewhere across uh, the cerebral cortex. And we do not see this transient somatostatin circuit in V1. So we've recorded a whole bunch of layer four. There are actually more pyramidal cells in, in V1. And we never see uh, innovation from layer five. We've optotagged somatostatin cells. And yes, we get responsive and non-responsive populations. And what's really interesting is actually, you know, there's a bit of a delay in the recruitment of somatostatin cells in V1. Moreover, um, you know, this late passive phase, you can see very, very few responsive somatostatin cells. In actual fact, the ones in layer four are massively recruited, whereas they're, they're quite faint recruitment uh, in infogranular layers. So putting that all together, um, and last slide, I've made the argument that GABA-OG continuons, they, you know, they originate from this distinct embryonic source. Um, they form transient networks in the developing brain. And we believe these are critical for early sensory integration. If we play around with these somatostatin cells, we can certainly alter the tra trajectory for normal development in S1BF. But we believe there are different, if you like, scaffolds, different transient circuits across cortical areas. And I would argue that's because, you know, the interneurons have to meet the information processing demands in that area. For those of you with a clinical bent, I think this is critical to our understanding of etiology of neurodevelopmental disorders. Because if you impact on a population of interneurons, it might have quite different roles across different cortical areas. And that's it from me. Um, I would obviously like to thank um, all the uh, current lab members, all of those that contributed to the studies I've spoken about, and of course, all of those that aren't listed here and our funders um, who continue to support us. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. So um, the next speaker is myself. So I will share my screen. Uh, one second. Okay. So my name is uh, Kiki Sidropoulou. Uh, and uh, I will talk to you about critical periods of brain development and their role in neurodevelopmental disorders. So in terms of development, I will speak in a bit later than the stages that Simon mentioned before. So um, just very general, brain development initiates in embryonic life with neurogenesis and uh, neuronal migration. However, it, it continues through the postnatal life until adulthood with several processes such as gliogenesis, synaptogenesis, myelination, and lastly, synaptic pruning. Um, so while they're at the beginning during embryonic and early postnatal life, there, are, there is an increase in the number of synapses formed. During synaptic pruning, this syn some of the synapses are eliminated and are adjusted to environmental stimulation. Except for synaptic pruning, there are other developmental events. For example, you see here a timeline of different developmental events such as long-term potentiation, uh, the switch of the GABAergic function from depolarizing to hyperpolarizing, and the maturation of uh, interneuron intrinsic properties in the visual cortex. Um, and these, you see some are before synaptic pruning and some processes uh, coincide with synaptic pruning. 
So um, as Simon touched upon it at the end of his talk, so not all cortical areas mature the same way. So synaptic pruning is known to be to happen at the earliest point in the sensory motor cortex and at a later time point in the parietal and the prefrontal cortex. So my talk will uh, um, focus on the prefrontal cortex, which is the highest, let's say, association area. And it's uh, located in the very frontal part of the frontal lobe. It is highly developed in humans. And while there is a strong debate as to whether rodents have a prefrontal cortex, because rodents is what we use in our research, um, data suggests that, so initially the prefrontal cortex was um, um, indicated as uh, the cortical area that receives uh, projections from the medio dorsal nucleus of the thalamus. And also we know that rodents perform similar uh, functions, behavioral functions um, that are supported by the prefrontal cortex in humans as well. Um, so the developmental events in the prefrontal cortex are, are slightly different and a lot of them are not known. So for example, synaptic pruning takes place during the adolescence period. So much later than the synaptic pruning that takes place in the early sensory cortices. Uh, during the synaptic pruning period, the long-term potentiation, potentiation, which is uh, related to synaptic plasticity, starts to emerge initially low and it becomes higher. It is increased after synaptic pruning in adulthood. Uh, similarly, working memory function and temporal memory, which are two functions that are depend on the prefrontal cortex, emerge during the early adolescence period, but they are significantly increased in performance. They are improved significantly in adulthood after the end of synaptic pruning. Very little information is known about the GABAergic function, either the switch from depolarizing to hyperpolarizing function of the receptor or the maturation properties of the interneurons. So in my lab, we set out to try to understand the neurodevelopmental events that take place in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, for this, we recorded patch clamp, we performed patch clamp recordings uh, in the whole cell configuration on postnatal day 10 in the mouse and postnatal day 20. So this is in the second and the third postnatal week. Uh, so we measured initially the spontaneous inhibitory postsynaptic currents and the spontaneous excitatory postsynaptic currents. For the SIPSCs, the inhibition, uh, so we, we find that the inhibition significantly increases at P20 in the PFC compared to P10. However, with regards to excitation, we find a, a significant reduction from P10 to P20. Because this is a bit counterintuitive in terms of development, uh, we performed, um, we used the drugs that uh, block the synaptic receptors that underlie spontaneous IPSCs and EPSCs to try to better understand this. So in the spontaneous IPSCs, as expected, by Qtulin significantly eliminated or significantly blocked, but it basically eliminated the spontaneous IPSCs, both in P10 and P20, while CNQX and AP5, which are blockers of the AMPA and NMDA receptors, the glutamatergic receptors, they did not have an effect. Similarly, at P20, um, bicuculin did not affect the spontaneous CPSCs. However, CNQX and AP5 significantly blocked the spontaneous CPSCs. The interesting uh, data is at P10 in PFC, in which the spontaneous uh, EPSCs were blocked by both CNQX, which is a, a NAMPA receptor antagonist, and by Qculin, which is a GABA receptor antagonist. So these data indicate that the GABAergic receptor function is still depolarizing, um, so causes depolarization at P10. And this is important because at the early, so in the visual cortex, it is known that the switch occurs at the end of the first postnatal week. So at P10, it should be hyperpolarized. So to better validate this uh, suggestion, we performed the evoked IPSCs in layer two in the PFC. 
and um, at different uh, voltage steps in order to measure the, the reversal potential. So indeed, the reversal potential at P10 is highly depolarized and it becomes hyperpolarized at uh, P20. Although if you see, this is still quite more depolarized than the normal minus 70 or minus 80 that is seen at the more mature stages. In addition, we measured the interneuron active properties and specifically we measured interneurons that uh, derive from the medial ganglionic eminence, which include the parvalgumin expressing interneurons. These are the fast spiking interneurons. So we, we perform current clamp, current clamp recordings and the major effect we found was that the fast, the fast after hyperpolarization, so this dip here, is very small at P10 and starts to increase at P20. If we give a step pulse that is of longer duration, we find that at P10, the firing pattern is more of a regular spiking while it becomes more fast spiking at P20. However, even at P20, this fast spiking pattern is still not the same as uh, the mature interneurons fast spiking pattern is. Therefore, these data show us, or fill the gap, let's say, on uh, what the gap of, on how the GABAergic receptor function and the interneuron intrinsic properties develop in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, so we find that the reversal potential is significantly delayed and also the maturation properties of uh, the interneuron intrinsic properties. Now, the GABAergic function is significantly affected in neurodevelopmental disorders, such as schizophrenia, and the uh, perturbations of early life GABAergic function could contribute to the emergence of siblings. Besides GABA, inhibition of the NMDA receptors has also been linked to schizophrenia, which is also a neurodevelopmental disorder. That has resulted in the development of the neonatal MK801 animal model of schizophrenia. MK801 is an NMDA receptor antagonist. However, the literature um, reports various time points at which this MK801 is administered. So uh, we wanted to determine whether there are distinct early lifetime periods that MK has an effect and what type of effect does it have. So we treated mice with the MK801 in two different, in two distinct time periods, postnatal day 11 to 15 and postnatal day 7 to 14. And when these mice became adults, we tested them on behavioral experiments, object recognition tasks, sociability, and performed uh, electrophysiological recordings of upstates. So in uh, short, very short, uh, we performed three different types of object recognition tasks, the novel object, the object to place, and the temporal order. The mice that were treated from P7 to P14 they performed poorly in all three different types of object recognition tasks, while the mice that were treated from P11 to P15 performed poorly only in the temporal order object recognition task. So this task depends primarily on the prefrontal cortex, while the other two tasks perform, uh, depend mostly on the hippocampus. In addition, we performed the, the sociability and social memory tasks in which we find that P7 to 14 treated mice perform poorly in the sociability task, while P11 to 15 mice perform poorly in the social memory task. Finally, the upstates, which represent the sustained activity within the current circuits, was impaired in both uh, groups of mice. So to conclude, um, I showed you briefly data that show that maturation of the GABAergic system is significantly delayed in the medial prefrontal cortex compared to primary sensory areas, that inhibiting the NMDA receptor at distinct time periods during early life results in differential effect in cognitive and social behavior. And these results suggest and uh, provide more, inf more, pro uh, more data that um, tell us that the timeline of developmental events is different across different brain regions and this, this should be taken into account when trying to understand the, the etiology, the symptoms, uh, but also therapeutic applications for neurodevelopmental disorders. 
So finally, I would also like to thank all the people in my lab. So the first part, all the GABERGIC system was performed by Katerina Kalemaki in collaboration with Domna Karagoyeos at the University of Crete, and more recently by Ageliki Veli, a PhD student in my lab. Uh, while the MK801 experiments were performed by Maria Plataki, a PhD student in the lab, and Kostas Diskos, who is a master thesis student in the lab. Um, so uh, that's the end of my story. And I will stop sharing in order to allow Judith Homberg to, to share. So the, the third uh, speaker is Judith Homberg. Um, she's a professor at Radboud University and the and the scientist at Donders Institute for Brain Cognition and Behavior. Um, and you can see the title of her talk. So, well, thank you, Kiki, for introducing me. And I also would like to thank the fans for organizing this wonderful webinar. As a uh, start comment, you see that I have a thing on my head, so I had a small surgery yesterday, so I'm fine. So just ignore that. Okay, so I would like to talk about serotonin, um, one of the modulate, neuromodulators that affect a brain development. Um, so serotonin, you might know, is a very important neurotransmitter in the adult brain. Uh, it is for instance, a target of a lot of uh, uh, drugs that are used in psychiatry, so like antidepressant drugs and anxiolytic drugs and uh, um, antipsychotic drugs. Uh, but actually, in the early uh, early brain development, serotonin has a uh, very different role. So it, we know that in uh, early brain development, serotonin influences a variety of neurodevelopmental processes, including cell proliferation and differentiation, uh, exon outro, and migration of neurons. So uh, it is a little bit too much to explain everything that serotonin does in, in, in early brain development. But here, I would like to give you one example um, of, an, um, of an article published in, in um, molecular psychiatry in 2011. So here, the researchers um, um, had grown uh, neurons in a dish. Uh, these were excitatory neurons that were uh, migrating. And when they applied serotonin to their dish, they found that the migration of these neurons was stopped. And then when they washed away the serotonin, the migration continued. You also see on the next um, um, graphs that uh, both at embryonic day 70.5 and postnatal day 0.5, uh, that um, the mean speed of the migration of these cortical uh, excitatory neurons is much regulated by serotonin. So you can imagine that if you in early life have an increase in serotonin levels, that this has an effect on the recreation speed of these cortical excitatory neurons, and that this uh, can affect brain development and um, uh, later on in later life affect all kinds of uh, behaviors that are dependent um, um, on these excitatory neurons. So that is what we are interested in. Um, so there are different uh, ways through which uh, serotonin can be affected in your life. Um, and for that, we focus on the serotonin transporter, which is here abbreviated by CERT. So the serotonin transporter is responsible for the reuptake of serotonin after it has been relieved in the senator cleft back into the presynaptic nerve terminal. And there are certain conditions that lead to an inhibition of the serotonin transporter. So for instance, um, some um, uh, women uh, who are depressed during pregnancy have to be treated by antidepressant drugs. Usually they are, these are of the class uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And uh, these SSRIs, as actually the name already say, they inhibit the serotonin transporter. And this leads to an uh, increase in serotonin levels. And another condition that can lead to an uh, increase in serotonin levels through um, uh, less function of the serotonin spotter is by inherited downregulation of the serotonin spotter. So on the next slide, I will explain that a little bit more. Also, why these conditions are relevant. Um, so um, depression um, is, well, pregnancy is actually a risk factor for depression. And if a woman, woman uh, is depressed, she has to be treated. And in about 2% of all pregnancies, or yeah, I would say between one and 2% of all pregnancies, SRIs are being used. And of course, these SRIs are beneficial for, for the mother, but they can also um, uh, cross the placenta and uh, reach the fetus and thereby act on the fetal brain. 
And what is relevant here is that there are, uh, this is really a hot topic in, in literature, if you have a check, that there is a debate whether or not this prenatal SRI exposure leads to a risk for neurodevelopmental disorders, especially autism. So this is really still a debate because um, in human studies, it is difficult to control for every, every confounding factor. Um, so um, yes, yeah, so, so it is not really certain, but uh, that is why we will do uh, animal research to, um, uh, to help out um, uh, investigating the role of serotonin in brain development through a prenatal SRI treatment. Um, another condition is uh, the inherited down regulation of the serotonin supporter. So this is a polymorphism in humans, which is very common. And it involves a short allele com that compared to long allele is associated with a less efficient transcription of the serotonin supporter gene. And about 20% of the human population has this uh, polymorphism. So these, have the, these are carrying the short, short genotype. And um, there is a, a lot of literature uh, suggesting that uh, this short, short condition uh, is a risk factor for stress-related disorders and possibly also neurodevelopmental disorders. So um, investigating the role of serotonin in brain development is very relevant for understanding these conditions. So as I mentioned, we are using rodents to investigate um, the role of serotonin a little bit more in detail because the advantage of animals is that you can control everything uh, from the environment. You can also do more invasive brain uh, analysis. So to investigate perinatal fluxetine exposure, um, we are treating uh, pregnant dams with fluxetine from crustaceans day 11 until postnatal day seven. And we choose these days because at crustaceans day 11, uh, the serotonin neurons are born in the brain, at least in the rodent brain. And postnatal day seven grossly corresponds to the birth in humans. So rodents are a little bit, uh, are born a little bit immature compared to humans. Um, and uh, to mimic the inherited serotonin supporter down regulation in humans, we are using rats that lack the serotonin disorder. So on the top, you see some uh, brain slices, which are representing serotonin transporter binding. And in a full knockout, the minus minus, the serotonin supporting binding is lost. You see also a an, an figure with serotonin levels in the brain. So in red knockout animals, and you see that uh, they have very high serotonin levels in the brain. So we can expect that this leads to neurodevelopmental changes. And to investigate that, we followed up these two models um, uh, at the behavior level, um, during um, the um, early neonatal phase, the juvenile phase, adolescence, and also adulthood. So I will show you now several of these behavioral data. So in early life, we measured um, uh, motor and reflex development. So uh, first of all, we measured ne negative geotexis. So the animals were placed on a slope with face downwards, and we measured the time they needed to face up. And both um, prenatal, uh, perinatal fluxine exposure and serotonin support and knockout led to a um, delay in development. So the animals needed more time to phase up. We measured uh, motor behavior by doing a swimming test with the scoring as shown here on this uh, slide. And again, we found that the fluxetine and the uh, uh, fluxetine exposed animals and the serotonin sport and knockout vets showed a an an, an delay in their motor development. So a little bit later in life, we measured in the animals um, um, olfactory discrimination so the pups were placed in an empty cage. In one side of the cage, there was familiar sawdust uh, uh, that was derived from a mother. And on the other side, there was fresh sawdust. And the pups were crawling to the familiar sawdust because they wanted to get to their mother. And we found that both the fluxetine exposed animals and the serotonin supported knockout rats needed more time for this. So they show a delay also in the development of this, um, yeah, you could say social sensory discrimination. Further, we measured repetitive behavior. Um, so the animals were placed in an open field with three objects, and we just measured the time the animals uh, were exploring a single object. Um, so here we found that prenatal fluxine exposure had no effect, but in the serotonin sport and knockout vets, we found during um, uh, adolescence and adulthood that the knockout vets were exploring one object uh, a lot, uh, which is indicative for repetitive behavior. So if we summarize these behavioral findings, we see that first of all, um, the effects of prenatal, uh, perinatal uh, fluxetine exposure and serotonin support and knockout are very similar. So that is quite striking uh, that, um, that drug use by, by, by the mother 
is having about the same effects as knockout of the serotonin spotter. And also it, it is interesting that these uh, phenotypes um, are uh, resembling those, um, those of autism. Um, so um, some years ago, I have written um, a review um, where we actually summarized um, the findings, the similar effects of perinatal SRI exposure and serotonin spotter knockout uh, effects on brain development. Uh, so there are similarities at, at brain, uh, behavioral level, but also at the level of the brain. And here you see some of these similarities. Um, and one striking similarity was found in the somatosensory cortex. Uh, so um, this was also already uh, tackled by, by Simon. So I would like to, uh, to deep a little bit more on, on to the developmental changes in the somatosensory system through serotonin. So here you see pictures of cytochrome uh, oxidase C staining of the barrel cortex. Um, so the barrels represent the whiskers. Um, so um, you see every time the control conditions and then prenatal fluxine exposure, postnatal fluxine exposure and CERT knockout. Um, and um, well, under, when we were applying uh, fluxetine in a prenatal phase, you don't see changes much in the, in the barrel uh, pattern. But if we uh, applied fluxetine during the uh, early postnatal phase, we saw that um, you can see it by naked eye, um, that the barrels were smaller and also that the space between the um, barrels was smaller. And the same was found in serotonin for the knockout beds. We also quantified that, you see that in the, in the graphs, and there is a clear difference in barrel size and septa due to knockout of the serotonin disorder. So apparently an increase in serotonin levels has a major influence on the, the morphology of the barrel cortex. There are also functional changes in the barrel cortex. So um, on the left uh, top, you see um, data of a micro array study where we stimulate brain slices on the place of the, the, the cross. And you see the, the neural response of the surrounding neurons, which was much higher in the serotonin trans transport and knockout vets, suggesting that uh, there is hyper excitability in the knockout vets um, in the barrel cortex. We also conducted um, uh, ex vivo electrophysiology experiments. We stimulated a nucleus in the thalamus and recorded in um, uh, excitatory neurons, which were uh, either directly innervated by the, um, uh, the thalamus, but also indirectly by uh, inhibitory neurons. So here we were investigating a feed forward inhibition. And we found that the ratio between GABA and AMPA, so between GABA and, and, um, and glutamate actually, was decreased in the serotonin for the knockout rats, which suggests that these animals are, um, are characterized by reduced GABAergic inhibition of the excitatory neurons, making these neurons more excitatory. And we also found by immunostainings um, that um, um, the number of uh, GABAergic mutons uh, were uh, reduced in the serotonin for the knockout rats. So in green, you see the glutamatelic neurons, and in red, the uh, GABAergic mutons that are surrounding an uh, excitatory neuron, and these numbers were reduced. So again, a reduction in the inhibition of the excitatory neurons. So to further understand uh, how this would affect um, sensory motor uh, integration, we conducted a gap crossing task. It is shown here. It is actually a relatively simple task. The animals are tested in the dark, and they have to uh, use the whiskers to cross a gap between platforms. We also record, recorded this behavior and we made an open source database out of this. Um, and this, uh, this database, of course, everybody can use it and we also use it ourselves. And what we amongst others found is that um, um, both the serotonin spot and knockout rats and the fluxine exposed animals actually needed less touches with the whiskers to the platform to make the jump. Um, so on a lot of parameters, they are very similar, but in the, uh, in, in the uh, left bottom uh, slide, you see that the more close the animals are getting to the platform, the less uh, touches they need to make the decision. So apparently um, their whisker system is more sensitive. Then we did in silico uh, experiments um, to further understand what would be happening. And uh, so here you see all kinds of complex slides, but actually what these data show is that uh, normally in development, um, um, uh, the perception is developing by, uh, by the animal changing its uh, motor position compared to the object that is being explored. Uh, so by that, the exploration becomes more goal-directed. And this goal-directed behavior is lost in the serotonin sport and knockout beds as well as fluxetine-exposed animals. 
Um, and due to that, actually the pressure on the whiskers, um, the follicles to which the whiskers are connected is actually less. That is what these pictures show. Um, so these animals actually show an, a loss of adaptive motor control. And apparently this uh, hyper excitability that we found in the boreal cortex is a kind of compensation for that. So on the one hand, these animals might be less goal directed, but on the other hand, um, they, they might be um, more open to the environment because their perception is more broader. So they include also potential irrelevant information. So this could be one uh, potential route through which uh, changes in serotonin in development could contribute to uh, disorders like autism. So here I would like to attract your attention to a uh, European training network that we just started, where we uh, further will elaborate on the role of serotonin in brain development and its uh, uh, relation to neuropsychiatric disorders. So you might like to follow us um, to, to learn more about what ser uh, serotonin in brain development. And here's my summary. Uh, so serotonin influences uh, development of processes which become over... Uh, uh, when both genetic and uh, environmental factors lead to changes in serotonin levels. Uh, we see that early life inhibition of the serotonin supporter um, lead to a developmental delay, reduction in social sensory behavior and repetitive behavior. And, um, and uh, this might relate to uh, developmental changes uh, in, for instance, um, uh, uh, the somatosensory cortex. And last, I would like to uh, thank my colleagues, of course, my entire team, but especially PhD student Yvette Kruse and uh, PhD student um, Stephanie Miselli contributed to the experiments I, I demonstrated. Tansu Selikol um, uh, conducted the um, um, gap crossing tasks and Dirk Schubert the electrophysiology experiments. And Sean Ron Kolk is also very much involved in uh, our research on serotonin and development. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Judith. And the final speaker will be Camilla Bellone, uh, who is a professor in uh, Geneva University. Uh, and she will talk to us about neural circuits of social motivation. Yeah, so first of all, I would like to uh, thank Kiki for uh, inviting me for participating in this webinar and thanks for organizing all of that. So today I would like to present uh, data regarding the neuronal circuit underlying social motivation. And uh, you know, when you have uh, uh, a new friend, so you met someone uh, uh, that you don't know in the street, uh, there are several things that you have to understand and ask yourself. So first things, uh, whether the other person is a friend or is a foe, is a an adult or is a juvenile. And then what you have to do is to integrate uh, uh, information uh, uh, from the environment, from all the sensory modalities, and moreover, from the internal state. In other words, are you motivated, which is the status of your emotion or your arousal? And once you have integrated all of this information, you need then to decide whether you want to engage in a cooperative or conflictive behavior. Why this is very important, because if uh, any of these processes does not occur properly, or even if the integration of all this information does not occur, you may end up uh, in developing a neurodevelopmental disorder, as it happened, for example, in uh, autism spectrum disorder or schizophrenia. So one particular element we are interested in my lab is really to understand how motivation influences our decision to engage in cooperative uh, uh, behavior. So first thing that we asked was uh, which are the neuronal circuit important for this uh, social motivation. So in general, when we speak about motivation, it's hard not to think about uh, the mesolimbic cortical system and in particular about reward system. So this uh, circuit originates in the ventral tegmental area where there are dopamine neurons that project to the ventral striatum or nucleus accumbens and to the uh, prefrontal cortex. And actually it has been shown uh, in humans that when the uh, subjects are exposed to social visual stimuli, there is an activation of the ventral uh, striatum as you can see here from the bold signal. So the reward system is um, uh, um, maintained in the, you can find it in the rodents as well, where you have uh, exactly the same uh, system where dopamine neuron project to the nucleus accumbens and in prefrontal cortex. And what we have recently shown is that uh, the dopaminergic neuron of the ventral tegmental area are activated, as you can see here, 
when the conspecific stimuli is placed in the high field of uh, the experimental mouse. So this data was really showing that there was an activation of the reward system uh, and probably a release of dopamine within the ventral striatum. Now, there are also evidences that uh, the same reward system is altered in autism spectrum disorder, and this is at, is at the origin of a social motivation hypothesis. So what has been shown uh, in a patient affected by autism spectrum disorder is that there is a, a deficit, uh, a decrease in the structural integrity of uh, VTA to nucleus accumbens tract, and that uh, this uh, structural integrity is uh, correlated with the severity of a social interaction deficit. What does it mean is that uh, uh, more severe are the social deficit, uh, lower is the structural integrity of this tract. In uh, mice, uh, we have contributed to show that alteration in the ventral tegmental area, and in, in particular in uh, the dopaminergic neurons, uh, with uh, a gene that is related uh, to autism spectrum disorder, in this case was the neuroligin 3, you have a deficit in social behavior. And you can see here in uh, green, in these mice where we down regulated the neuroligin 3 in the VTA dopaminergic neuron, the mice do not show a proper familiarity to a familiar stimuli. And moreover, they do not show a response uh, to a familiar, a novel stimulus uh, when it is exposed. So all this data was uh, really suggesting that there is a relationship between the reward system and the uh, social behavior, and that maybe alteration uh, in uh, the social interaction related to psychiatric disorder like autism uh, may be the consequence of an aberrant development of the reward system. So a few years ago, when I was still a postdoc in the laboratory of Christian Lusher, I was able to show that uh, the postnatal development of the reward system, and in particular of the dopamine neurons of uh, the VTA, is under the regulation of the metabotropic glutamate receptor 1. In other words, what we were able to show is that the activation of the, this metabotropic receptor during the postnatal development was needed in order to switch the subunit composition of the AMPA receptor. So here, during very early postnatal development, you have a GLUE2 lacking AMPA receptor, then then are substituted by GLUE2 containing AMPA receptor later on. And this is really under the regulation of uh, the metabotropic glutamate receptor. So why this was important? So we started to think that maybe alteration in the metabotropic glutamate receptor signaling could the underlying deficit in the postnatal maturation. And uh, why this is relevant for autism spectrum disorder? Because as you can see in this uh, uh, graphic reported by the Dolan and Bear review, many of the genes that has been associated with autism spectrum disorder are synaptic gene. Indeed, uh, we speak about synaptic uh, uh, basis of autism spectrum disorder. And many of the genes uh, belong to the MDR pathway. Here you can see you have a P10, you have all the molecules that belong to mTOR signaling, and you have the shank 3 and the shank protein. So our hypothesis at the time was really that alteration in the mGluR itself or in the protein that were associated with mGluR will lead to an alteration in the development of the reward system and leading then eventually to deficit in social interaction and social motivation. So we uh, exploited the use of uh, a model, the Shank 3 mouse model for autism spectrum disorder, where the Shank 3 is a scaffolding protein that uh, uh, bind together directly and directly the metabotropic glutamate receptor with the ionotropic uh, uh, receptor NMDA and AMPA. And what we were able to show is that uh, whether you knock down uh, the shank 3 selectively in the VTA or you take the global uh, shank 3 knockout mouse, you end up with a, a, an aberrant uh, uh, composition of AMPA receptor here shown by an increase in uh, this ratification index that is a signature for this GUI2 lacking AMPA receptor. So does it mean that when you downregulate the shank 3 within this system, you end up with an immature synapses regarding to the AMPA receptor. So now our working hypothesis currently that really deficit in this postnatal maturation may lead to this uh, uh, social deficit. So we then focus on this uh, social deficit behaviorally, 
And uh, what we recently started to do is that uh, uh, um, try to reproduce what uh, people do, do normally in a clinical court. So to look longitudinally at the development of uh, social uh, uh, interaction through the postnatal development of uh, uh, the mice and see how this uh, would look like uh, in the shank-free knockout mice. So what we did it is that we took uh, a wild type uh, shank-3 heterozygous mice and shank-3 uh, knockout mice. And we look, so these are the same mice uh, 10 days uh, after each other. So what is 16, 26, 36, and 56. And we look when uh, this uh, social uh, deficit would uh, uh, raise. And what you could see nicely is that uh, in the shank-3 knockout mice, so you could start to see significant deficit in the social uh, interaction. This is a direct test of social interaction around 336. So we are starting a, a line of research in that, and I have no time to go in details, but we are really trying to look at the social motivation using operant uh, task for looking at the effort mice are available to do uh, and uh, to interact with others. But one thing that I would like to put your attention on is that uh, if you notice here, the heterozygous mice uh, that are representing uh, the most translationable uh, model uh, for human are not showing any deficit in the behavior. And somehow we were like uh, struggling with this data because uh, in patients, you have an apple insufficiency of the shank three. So many people criticize this model, say, okay, you are not looking uh, at the real clinical model, but you are overstating something. So we start to really think about what was happening, why this heterozygous mice did not show any behavioral phenotype. And one thing that is uh, quite uh, clear in the field uh, is this hypothesis that there are genetic and not genetic modifier that, that contribute to the behavioral phenotype in ASD. So in other words, uh, what can happen is that you have a genetic susceptibility, and these are different genes that has been identified in ASD, but then you can have uh, double eat mutation, epigenetic, copy number of variation, environmental or sex linker modifier, and then can uh, uh, act on this genetic susceptibility and uh, basically reveal this uh, uh, phenotype. So we decided to focus attention on how the environment could act on the genetic susceptibility and whether this could sufficient to reveal behavioral phenotype in our ASD mice model. So what we did is that we took a shank three, now just the wild type and the heterozygous mice. And during adulthood, we challenged these mice with an injection of uh, LPS that induced an uh, uh, inflama inflammatory um, response. So what we do is that 24 hours after this inflammatory response, we, uh, we uh, perform a social preference. So the mice, as Kitty has shown before, normally show the preference for the juvenile over the object. So here you have a wild type, uh, is uh, indeed the case, they prefer the social over the object. The wild type plus LPS challenge, uh, again, uh, show a preference for the social. The heterozygous plus the vehicle, as I show you, do not show any uh, alteration in social behavior. But now in the heterozygous, when we do the NLPS challenge, show a behavioral phenotype. Indeed, they do not prefer the social over object, but they spend the same amount of time exploring that both. So I don't go too much in details, but what uh, we have done is that we have performed a RNA second uh, on the ventral striatum, so in the nucleus accumbens. And actually what we reveal is that uh, there was uh, uh, in the shank three uh, mice, uh, an overexpression of a particular gene that is the TRPV4 that encode for uh, a, a channel that is important for the regulation of the neuronal excitability. So to make a long short, uh, the long story short, uh, actually we predicted that maybe was uh, this increase in TRPV4 after the, uh, the, in the shank three heterozygous after LPS that may lead uh, to a excitability of the reward system and deficit in social behavior. So just uh, I show you the last data where I can show you that to prove the causality between this gene and the behavior, what we did is that we uh, injected LPS in the mice heterozygous of wild type and we, at uh, the same time, one hour after, infused uh, within the ventral striatum in the nucleus accumbens, an inhibitor of the TRPV4. 
and then perform again social preference. So here you have uh, the shank 3 heterozygous plus LPS plus vehicle, where you still again in another court, you could show that there is a, a social impairment. But when we infuse uh, uh, the uh, inhibitor of the TRPV4, what we see is that we could rescue the uh, sociability. So now in conclusion, what I hope uh, I give you a flavor of what we are doing in the lab in this context. And so we show that the postnatal development of the reward system is regulated by the metabotropic glutamate receptor one. And then ASD related synaptic gene may affect the maturation of glutamatergic synapses within this uh, system. So deficit in the postnatal development of the reward system may affect social behavior. And finally, what I show you is unpublished data showing that inflammatory challenge may reveal behavioral phenotype in ASD susceptible models, proving the hypothesis of gene environmental interaction. Finally, the TRPV4 may promise promising pharmacological target for social deficit related to psychiatric disorder. So with that, I would like to thank people. In particular, this is the work of Stamattina Zanulino, uh, Stefano Musardo, Alessandro Contestabile. And this work was started also with Sebastiano Barizelli, that is a now postdoc at NIH. And I thank also the funding agency. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Camilla, for your talk. And I will pass uh, on to Simon, who will moderate the Q&A session. OK. Thank you, Kiki. Um, just to say to everybody, um, keep typing those questions in the Q&A box. We currently have 30 open questions. I don't think we're going to get through all of those um, in the time that we have, um, but we will endeavor to answer them all eventually. OK, so um, and that will be on the webinar page in, a, in about a week's time. All right. So I, I have been furiously going through these questions and um, what I'm going to start with is actually a, a general question. Um, it's a question uh, raised by Peter Coppola, and it's to all the panelists. Um, and maybe I'm going to warn Kiki that I'm going to go with her first because she's had the most time to recover from giving her <laughs> talk. Um, so to all panelists, to what extent do you think neuropsychiatric disorders are determined by such early brain development events? So um, for me, I, th I think they're, I, I'm determined that they're, uh, that they are caused by early, by perturbation of early life uh, events. So, um, and that's the, that's the difficult part in, in trying to develop therapeutic or applications or even just understand these behaviors. Uh, because as we, as you showed in, as we all showed, you know, different brains, different systems have different timelines. And um, it will take a humongous effort to, to understand which part is, you know, is important for which type of neuropsychiatric disorder. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I would absolutely agree with that. Uh, Judith, do you have any thoughts that you want to add to that? No, or? I think Kiki gave a wonderful answer. I have not, nothing to add. All right. Um, in which case, actually, Peter has a follow-up question, and I guess this is more aimed at, at, at you and Camilla, which is, should we think of neurotransmitter systems, e.g. dopamine, as having a specific and consistent role function, or are there great variations in function across layers, brain regions, developmental periods, etc.? Judith, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, as a challenging question, I would say. Um, I, I think our knowledge about the role of these neuronal modulators in brain development is just emerging. We hardly know anything. And um, so, so, uh, so based on histological data, we know that the serotonin fibers are uh, slowly during brain development uh, entering, for instance, the prefrontal cortex and direct, thereby contacting relin cells and thereby influencing, for instance, yeah, the migration of the excitatory neurons. Um, and also there is, uh, we also have data that there is um, a co-development uh, of the serotonin and, and dopaminergic neurons that project to the prefrontal cortex and they probably interact. But I think it is all hugely complex and we are just at the start of uh, trying to understand it. Mm, yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, Camilo, do you want to, to add to that or are you? 
No, it's fine. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's very complex question, right? And so, I mean, I'm always thinking about the, the dopamine and serotonin. They really are modulator, right? That the act on the, uh, then modulate the glutamatergic or the GABAergic transmission. And I think that they may play a major role uh, in uh, many of the findings that has been shown even in terms of uh, excitation inhibition. So, uh, and I think this is open uh, all a new venture, right? For um, new hypotheses. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, one interesting thing, and actually I just, I just wanna pick up on another question, which has come in from Carolina uh, Farrell. Um, None of us have talked about depression. So actually her question is, can you comment on the relationship between neurodevelopmental disorders, dysfunction of dopamine, serotonin, and the risk for depression? And none of us uh, have addressed that particular um, developmental disorder, or do we think it's not a developmental disorder? Maybe just, I, I want to just uh, uh, say something in this uh, related to this. I mean, it's true that sometimes we speak about uh, autism, schizophrenia, depression, and we name that because we are forced to name from the clinic, right? But in terms of uh, relevance for what we are all doing, probably speaking about research domain eh, is more accurate. So I guess that everything I show you regarding social motivation is not necessarily only related to autism, but we actually starting to see similar stuff in uh, uh, schizophrenia related model and I guess the similarity can be seen in uh, any depressive model so I, I think that if we start to think uh, in uh, this direction it will be uh, easier to, to develop a, a new uh, therapeutic approach. Mm, absolutely yeah um, okay I, I realize I'm avoiding questions by asking them so um, actually but I'm going to pick up one that uh, was asked earlier by uh, Konkona Dutta. Um, and Konkona writes, um, as mentioned in the presentation, the transcription factor in Uregulin 1 b 4 is responsible for proper development, gabriogic interneurons. Can they both act as biomarkers uh, for neuropsychiatric disorders? Um, and maybe you know, once I've spoken, I can I can open this up, and Kiki might might want to start. Is actually thinking about ways that we can translate to the clinic. I think what we've heard is some really exciting sort of fundamental uh, scientific research. Um, and I know Camilla touched on this actually in her talk. But um, where do we think this is going? Um, Judith might want to comment, obviously, on the, the SSRIs as well. Um, in terms of Neuregulin 1 and ERB4, I think they're, they're, they're quite controversial. Um, they haven't really come up in GWAS studies, uh, save, you know, they were at one stage implicated uh, in schizophrenia. And so I think we've got to treat these with a little bit of caution. Um, in terms of using as biomarkers. But what I think they really do tell us about is, is mechanism. That if we can understand you know, genes and molecules that are important for the integration of these particular cell types, um, and they could be quite varied, then that helps us understand how the circuits maybe go wrong. And ultimately we could translate that to a better understanding of human disorders. Um, I think sometimes we're all a bit too keen to pick on a particular marker and say, oh, this is, you know, this is the one for this given developmental disorder. But I think what we've got to appreciate is that we're really starting to reveal many of the dynamics of the early mechanisms. Um, and I, I think that's a really important step forward. Uh, Kiki, do you want to come in on that? Yes, I can say something. Um, so I totally agree with the, what you said. I think uh, although pharmaceutical companies and people are, you know, they tend to gravitate towards having one molecule for one disease, mm -hmm. I think in, in the brain that's impossible. And uh, so I think it's important to identify, you know, Gene, inter gene networks or neuronal networks that contribute specific phenotypes. 
And I think it, I think we, you know, people, there are some labs that work bottom up, there are some labs that work top down. And I think by, do, by having these um, two approaches, at some point we will be able to understand molecules or combinations of molecules that contribute to a specific phenotype. And I think a biomarker will be for neuropsychiatric disorders might be something more complicated. So it won't be one molecule. It will be either a combination of molecules or it will be brain patterns, you know, with EEGs or fMRIs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, does either Judith or Camilla want to come in or are you? We're okay with that. Okay, um, then I'm actually going to have a specific question for, for Judith. Um, it's from Volko Straub. And the question is, do you think that the changes in barrel cortex morphology are caused by direct effects of serotonin on the morphology of cortical neurons? Or are these indirect consequences of serotonin dependent changes in thalamocortical projections? Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, it could be both. Uh, of course, um, the barrel cortex also um, needs input and activation for its development, which occurs via the thalamus. Eh? So it cannot develop just uh, autonomously. So it needs input. But it could also be that serotonin itself uh, affects uh, the barrel cortex. So we also have done a study uh, in humans, actually, where we investigated how mother serotonin spotted gene affected uh, brain development in offspring. And there, uh, just uh, we did just a very uh, brain-wide analysis and we found that uh, the somatosensory cortex was affected. So apparently serotonin itself might also, without any uh, uh, sensory input or whatever, uh, affect the formation of the barrel cortex. So it might be both. All right, certainly it's a, Pleiotropic neurotransmitter. It's doing everything, I think. So, yes, I guess so, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to next ask one to, to Camilla. There's a lot of questions still coming in. So, we, um, we will try and get through these as quickly as possible. Um, so, we have one from uh, Sa Sabine Hulter, um, which is quite simply, what is the clinical relevance of the LPS challenge in the Shank 3 mice, Camilla? Yeah, so I, I have not much time to go in more details, but actually the LPS generate an inflammatory response. And we have shown that with an increase in the interleukin and other inflammatory markers. So what we think is that we are at the basis of, uh, there is in literature, a lot of uh, hypotheses related that uh, the inflammation can worsen in some of the uh, behavioral symptoms uh, in uh, autistic uh, patients. And so I think that here we have somehow the, the proof that uh, this may happen uh, uh, in an animal model. So I think it's really generate an inflammatory response. Okay, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm going to take a, a question that was posed by uh, Patricia Gaspar and actually at the same time do, do one that also uh, was, was posed by Fahad Husinov. Um, but Patricia's question was, great talks, question for Simon Butt. Do you know what the role of somatostatin release by interneurons is for the maturation of S1 circuits? Um, and I should say, Fahad's question was more about why focus on somatostatin interneurons. Um, so in relation to Patricia's one, uh, we have no idea what the neuropeptide is doing. And, uh, you know, I think we, we're we hearing about dopamine and serotonin from the others. I think that that's would be a really exciting thing to look at, um, particularly given that the somatostatin cells are so strongly recruited, we could imagine that they, they are dumping some somatostatin into the circuit. Um, it has been shown to excite pyramidal cells. So you could get quite complex interactions between that and the GABA. But uh, I can't say that we've, we've actually looked at that at the moment. Um, Fahad's question was actually why focus on somatostatin interneurons. Um, and I didn't touch on this, but we know from development studies from you know, work, for example, from the Gord Fischel, Stuart Anderson's lab, is that there's some of the earliest born 
into neurons. And they occupy deep layers. And we know that the cortex is sort of built in an inside out manner. And so one of the reasons why we're going after them is that we hypothesize that they may be are there early on to sort of direct the circuits above. Um, whether or not that's the case across all cortical areas, I, I think we, we're going to have to find out. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to a, a question from uh, Felipe Gomez uh, to uh, Kiki. Um, in actual fact, one that I would probably ask, so I'm, I'm sort of cheating here. Um, do you expect that early life MK801 impacts on the maturation of specific subpopulations of GABAergic interneuron? So, um, yes, so the interaction between the GABA A receptor and the NMDA receptor is one that has been puzzling me, and uh, I'm trying to think of how to you know, move forward in order to investigate it. Uh, but on the other hand, besides the receptor, the interneuron maturation properties seem to happen after that point. So after P15 and you know, towards P20. And um, so on, although our initial goal, you know, when we started the MK81 models, um, we, one of our goals was also to study what happens, what does MK do you know, at this early life period? So we haven't got then around to that, but uh, it is our next, uh, you know, next goal to try to understand. But I do, you know, NMDA receptors have on parvarbium, especially interneurons, have been shown to, uh, you know, to be particularly important for schizophrenia as well. So it seems that in adolescent and adulthood that NMDA receptors on parvarbium interneurons. Um, um, you know, are the first ones to be inhibited when you use an MDA receptor antagonist. And uh, in addition, there is a, you know, a very detailed study from Wenjun Gao's lab, uh, who we investigated the NMDA currents and AMPA currents on all the different types of interneurons. And there are, I, I remember there are PV interneurons that have NMDA receptors early on, and then they lose them. So um, there is definitely some type of uh, interaction going on. Yeah, excellent. Okay, I, I think that uh, comprehensively answered the question. Um, okay, so one for, for Judith then, um, from Mark Walker. Um, is there a way to ensure that the reason behind the touch number being low is solely due to increased sensitivity as opposed to it being due to increased risk taking behavior. So I think this was. But it was about this uh, uh, gap crossing task, I guess. Yes, I, I presume. Um, yeah, so, um, so I think the question is about whether other potential factors, perhaps anxiety or risk taking, are influencing the performance of these animals. Um, yeah, that is a good question. Of course, uh, I think that is generally always the uh, complex issue with behavior because uh, yeah, you never can fully isolate um, the behavior because there are other factors that could be uh, playing a role. Um, uh, yeah, what's all I? Um, of, yeah, we do have uh, evidence that, for instance, serotonin spotting knockout rates and also perineal SRI exposure do uh, increase anxiety. So I can not really exclude that. that that's totally true. And about risk taking behavior, actually, um, uh, we have evidence that the serotonin spotting knockout rates take less risk. So I don't think that that plays a role here. But yeah, anxiety, we can't uh, fully exclude. That is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they quite anxious animals? Certainly, the knockout ones. Yeah, they they they, they tend to be very anxious. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, we've got one for Camilla here as well uh, from Jan Rodriguez Pakitna. Uh, uh, hopefully, I got that right. Um, in the three chamber task, did you consider comparing interaction time with a familiar versus unfamiliar conspecific yeah sure we um i think uh, if i don't remember 
uh, wrongly, we did it. Uh, and in the knockout, actually, at the beginning, we, we said, so there was a phenotype in the knockout, but not uh, when we downregulated Shang-3 specifically in the nucleus accumbens. So what, because we do some circuit manipulation to see which are the circuit that can recapitulate uh, some of the uh, behavioral phenotype. So we see that for the social uh, the sociability, the nucleus accumbens can recapitulate, but not the social novelty alteration that you can see it in the knockout. So this is why we focus only in the first part. Okay, sure, sure. Um, there's actually, I mean, maybe another question I could ask you, which um, has come from Duani Cord. Um, hi, Camilla, thanks for the presentation. Did you test the social interaction with only male mice? Yeah. It would be interesting. You did. <laughs> only male, yeah. Because the point is raised, it would also be interesting to see the effects of male and female or only female mice. Yeah. So this is, I mean, uh, is all about uh, uh, new things we are trying to do in the lab. So now I think we have get at the point where the clear idea of what is happening on the uh, dopamine and reward system in the context of re, uh, male to male interaction. Now we would like to compare uh, different uh, male female male pups uh, uh, in the female versus uh, male to male female versus male. So we are starting to do this type of experiment, and I think it's completely different the world, right? So we will we'll find probably some differences. So uh, mm -hmm. one step at the time. Sure. Sure. Ah, so much to do. So much to do. Um, okay, uh, I'll move on to a question for, to Kiki. Um, and it's from Abby Sarika Patnik. Um, does the GABA shift occur simultaneously at P7 in different brain regions? As from your data, it seems that the GABA shift is not completed by P7, least in prefrontal cortex. So in other regions, it could be different as well, right? Like in the hippocampus. It's possible, but I do think the hippocampus is one of the first regions to be studied. And I think that is P7, but anyways, I might not remember well, but I do think it's P7 and similar with barrel and visual. Although barrel might be different, you might know better. Um, Simon, but anyways, I do think that most more or less in the barrel and the visual and hippocampus is around P7 and the auditory. I know there is a recent study, but I can't remember at this moment exactly the finding. Yeah, I mean, I just reflecting on that, I, I think it's quite interesting in terms of maybe sort of brain wide communication that if we have slightly different time points at which the circuits are maturing how they then integrate across areas right yeah. um, so i think that the, the similar stage of maturation has a similar you know reversal or you know switch gamma switch um, yeah 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 okay um i have so many questions coming down here um so do please keep them coming in. Um, I think we, we've only got five more minutes for questions. Um, and, you know, we, but we will try and answer them all, as I say, um, online. Um, sorry, I'm going to scroll up quickly. I seem to. Uh, okay, there's. Um, so there's a question to Judith from uh, Sebastiano Baricelli. Um, is there any evidence of differential teratogenic, apologies if mispronounce that, effects of toxidine on developing somatosensory systems in females versus males? I guess this comes back to our, um, you know, trying to understand um, male-female differences. Yeah. In um, yeah, so it is actually a pity that um, yeah we, we focused on male animals. Um, I'm I'm quite sure that uh, males and females have been addressed in literature and in, in this field of research, but I don't know by all the data by heart. So so I'm I'm happy to answer this question um, later on at, and uh, we'll have a check in literature. 
Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, okay, so this is a little bit topical, this one, um, or certainly it's been, you know, in the neuroscience field recently. Um, it's from Romina Ambrosini uh, to all panelists. Do you think the, the gut microbiota of the mother could affect, and then there's a list, dopaminergic, gabaergic, serotonergic systems of a developing fetus. I'm gonna go to Camilla first on that one. <laughs> Sorry, just throw it out. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I mean, there are there is literature and there are beautiful papers uh, uh, recently uh, published and then show that there is a, an influence of microbiota, uh, in particular on social behavior. And somehow I think that it makes sense, right? I mean, uh, that so I, I believe that uh, there will be a new generation of studies where we can have a look exactly at the mechanism. Uh, of interaction between microbioma, microbiota and the neuronal circuit. Having said that, I think that uh, if you want to do study in this direction, you have so much control uh, over the microbiota of your mice. So I think that uh, the, 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 what I see problematic is uh, they then uh, make uh, some uh, uh, comparison uh, across labs, right? Because then you have to have a very uh, nice and detailed uh, uh, information about uh, everything you have in your mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think what one thing to take away is that we're already looking at different neurotransmitters across different areas, and it's complex. Um, yeah, it's another factor that we should consider. Uh, Kiki or Judith, do you want to come in on that, or you? Yeah, I, I can add a little bit. So there are a few uh, studies rising showing that uh, also maternal s use is actually affecting the maternal microbiota. Uh, so that could indeed potentially, uh, of course, affect the offspring development. And there is also data that s use itself uh, yeah, affects the microbiota in, and uh, it doesn't matter whether, whether you are a mother or not. Um, so, so yeah, you, you can certainly expect um, interactions, and I think um, yeah that this is just an emerging field. It's very exciting. Mm, let's see. Yeah, Kiki, are you? Well, the, I will agree with Camille about the complexity of uh, this uh, field. Um, one thing that I came across uh, upon reading on this is that um, th there seems to be this GABA producing and GABA. Um, uh, eating microbes in the gut and then you know it will be very interesting to see how microbiota interact with different transmitters and and whether they provide you know back and forth information yeah 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 absolutely okay um there's a whole raft of uh questions from natalia uh siganok um i'm gonna take one um just because it looks looks quite interesting for me. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, writes Natalia, if the different results between somatosensory and visual cortex could be influenced by B VIP interneurons, uh, interactions with somatostatin, due to a higher density of VIP interneurons in the visual cortex um, compared to somatosensory. I, you know, I think that is a really interesting question. Actually, the way I would take it is that I think every GABAergic interneuron contributes to early development. And I completely agree. If we see subtleties in the distribution of GABAergic interneurons across areas, I think that might play a part in, you know, certainly in the information transfer, but also the maturation of those particular circuits. Um, so I, th I think that's a great question. And it's certainly something that we're, we're considering uh, in the lab. Um, Natalia also asked Judith, um, well, actually, it's quite a, a broad question. How does serotonin modulate the barrel cortex? Which pathways are activated? Um, we're now one minute over, so Judith has about 30 seconds. To <laughs> okay. Well, I, I suggest that, um, that I will answer this uh, question on, on Ferenc's website by taking a little bit more time uh, to, to, to get, because it is not simple at all. And uh, yeah. Excellent. All right. Um, I think then, in which case, 
um, that's a good point to say that all the other questions, and I appreciate there are 56 live questions still, um, we will do our utmost uh, to answer in the written feedback. But thank you very much for participating, certainly on my behalf, and I, I will pass it back to Kiki maybe just to say final words. Yeah, well, yes, I would like to thank uh, all the people who attended this webinar. I hope it was useful. I would also like to thank Simon, Camilla, and Judith for uh, agreeing to do this. Um, and uh, of course, I would like to thank the Fence uh, Chat Committee and uh, Michaela and Andrea for, for all their help in organizing this webinar. So good afternoon, everybody.